Hello, um, I'm here today to take you on a virtual tour of the museum. My, my name's Fiona. So, um, to give you an idea, first of all, of where we are at all, we've got these amazing pictures here and we'll go from the general uh, to the specific, as they say. So if you look at this picture here, you've got an aerial shot of Nuremberg, uh, larger Nuremberg actually, and you've got two shaded areas. Um, one of them looks a bit like a spear, um, and that's uh, what we call the Nazi party rally grounds, the former Nazi party rally grounds, a very large area in the southeast of the city. The other uh, shaded area that you can see here um, is the walled city of Nuremberg, with which many of you might be familiar, um, Nuremberg. Um, as you can see, uh, the rally grounds themselves were appreciably larger uh, than the city, six times the size. So it gives us an idea of the scale on which um, Hitler wished to um, carry out these um, infamous rallies of his. This picture, uh, we get a much detailed, more detailed look if we go on to the second picture here. Um, and you can see a diagram, or rather a photograph, um, of the rally grounds. Um, the first thing you also notice is you've got um, different shades um, on this picture. You've got the black and white parts, and you've got tinted areas. Um, when you're looking at the area, uh, the tinted areas simply denote things that are no longer there, or were actually never realised. Um, the big thing about um, all the buildings that were proposed here for the rally grounds is simply the fact that most were never produced, were never realized, um, except two. And we're actually standing in one of them now, which is the most interesting bit about the museum. We're actually in a 1930s building, but one that was never actually completed at the time. Um, so if you want to see where we're actually standing at the moment, um, it's this building here. Um, later on, we're going to take a much closer look at it at the end of the tour. Um, just to finish off though, let's look at the last picture here, which is this one, um, and you can see that uh, we're actually um, in this part here. Uh, but the building itself was of course appreciably larger, and later on uh, we're going to take a closer look at this central element. They started building it in 1935, work ground to halt on it in roughly 1940. Work was very desultory from 40 to 42. Almost nothing went on, for obvious reasons, of course, uh, because we were in the middle of the Second World War. Um, the museum itself then, as we said, opened 2001 um, in this building. Um, an architect by the name of Gunther Dominic um, won the call. Um, the city um, issued a call for architectural ideas. It was won by the Austrian architect Gunther Dominic, and he re realized the museum in this one part of the building. And if you look around, you'll see that he very cleverly introduced modern materials, concrete, steel, glass, into the original red brick structure. It makes a very stark contrast, and that was his intention. And we're actually going to see what he did. Um, at the time when it was opened, the press made a very um, apt um, play on words. They called it the spear through the spear. Uh, the reference being to the entrance, which runs like a spear right through the building. And of course, the play on words was referring to the architect Albert Speer, who later, of course, became one of the most influential um, personages in the, the Nazi regime at all. Um, I'd like to take you now, though, um, into the exhibition itself, uh, which is situated on the third floor. So if you'll join me now, we'll take to the stairs. So here on the um, third floor, uh, we have the entrance uh, to the exhibition. Um, just perhaps to, to go over it again, uh, the actual building um, is called the Documentation Center. Uh, the traditional name, of course, uh, that was chosen by the Nazis was the Congress Hall, the Congress Halle. And uh, most remiss of me, I haven't mentioned the name of the exhibition yet. And um, when we designed the exhibition, we decided not to put it up into words, but to um, portray it in pictorial form. So you have these two very large pictures 
um, at the entrance to the exhibition. Um, and you can see here the large blown up shot uh, shows you what was really a preparation for the real thing to come, a display of military prowess, um, and later, of course, to result in the, the Second World War. And here in the inset, um, you have uh, some spectators at one of these rallies and in a typical salute, of course, uh, the Hitler salute. Um, and that reveals for us um, the title uh, of the exhibition, which is namely Fascination, as we can see here, Fascination with the Führer and the cult and these goings on, and uh, the terror, of course, which was very soon uh, to erupt. So fascination and terror, and that's the name of the museum, uh, or rather the name of the, the exhibition. So fascination and terror, the two sides of the coin, if you like. Uh, we're going to start off now, though, in the first room. Here in the first room then, um, we go into the background, the 1920s, which was a period um, of great upheaval, of course, um, and especially here in Germany, having lost the First World War, um, and resulted, of course, among other, in a massive hyperinflation. And one of our exhibits here is very interesting. Um, when we look down there, we can see the banknotes, and we can see the amount of zeros um, on those banknotes. That situation, um, of course, led to um, varying factions being for power against the, the young, the very young Weimar Republic, um, right and left wing. Uh, one of them, of course, was uh, the party whose spokesman uh, was Hitler. And Hitler, in fact, uh, attempts what we call the Beer Hall Putsch. Um, in 1923. And for that, of course, he is um, brought to justice, but it's a very mild sentence that he gets. If we look at this poster here, Das Urteil, uh, the German for the judgment um, in the Hitler process, uh, the Hitler trial. Um, despite having tried to overthrow the government, basically a coup d'etat, um, Hitler only gets uh, five years, and he actually never actually finished them. Um, he was treated almost as a VIP, and it also gave him the leisure to complete his book, uh, Mein Kampf. Um, by 1945, um, you ended up with around uh, uh, 10 million copies of it being printed in 12 different languages, and it certainly solved any pecuni pecuniary problems uh, that he'd had in the past. Uh, um, Hitler then um, is, as we said, he's imprisoned and he loses his most um, effective weapon, you might say, which is, of course, uh, the right to public speaking. Uh, later on, though, of course, um, the economy recovers uh, to a certain extent. Uh, we see a gradual recovery setting in. And that then um, is put paid to uh, by something that, again, affected the whole world. Um, Many people know it as the Wall Street crash, the Great Depression of 1929. And in fact, we have Hitler's biographer, um, Ian Kershaw, mentioning at one point in his book, if it hadn't been for that, Hitler might have been history. But of course, that was not the way it went. And we've got a very interesting graph here um, to have a look at uh, what, among other, uh, was a repercussion of the Great Depression and the fact that Germany was once again in a dire situation. People were desperate, people were starving, people were out of work and made them, um, of course, uh, more keen to listen to extreme uh, measures proposed by these warring factions. Um, if we head over here to the graph, it gives us a very clear view um, of how the um, political uh, landscape developed in those years. Um, I'm not dreadfully keen on graphs, but this one really shows us um, the very variated landscape. You've got lots of different parties here, as we said, being for power. Um, what you initially can't see um, in the 1920s, and for a long time, of course, is the very bottom party here, which is, of course, Hitler's um, uh, Nazi party. Um, it basically doesn't figure at all. That doesn't change um, until, of course, roughly here, where, as we said, you have the Wall Street crash. And then, of course, um, the Nazi party picks up ground massively. And as we can see, um, 
garners 44% um, by 1933, um, establishing, firmly establishing Hitler in power. Um, interestingly, uh, when we look at the posters above us here too, we can see an important aspect of that regime, and that was their handling um, of publicity, if you like, um, their propaganda measures. You, above us here, we've got various posters, um, again, from different parties. Um, but taking a look at them, uh, one certainly stands out, and it's the last one. Uh, um, if we look at it here, um, in contrast to the others, which are you know, very complicated to look at, lots of um, graphical elements, lots of text, um, the one that really stands out and makes very clear um, mention of it is, is the last one, um, Unsere letzte Hoffnung, uh, Our Last Hope. And again, contrast to the other posters, it's telling voters to, you know, who to vote for and who is that person? Hitler. Uh, so even here we see that uh, uh, the Nazi um, um, engagement with their propaganda was uh, more effective, more sophisticated uh, than perhaps their rivals. But we're going to have a look at this propaganda element in the next room as well. Here in the second room, um, many of you might be familiar with this site, um, the Brandenburg Tor uh, or Brandenburg Gate uh, in Berlin. And we obviously have a procession here. Uh, with many, many people celebrating something. Of course, it was the victory parade um, of Hitler and his party having won the elections. Except, of course, it's not. Um, this was one that the Nazis shot, uh, if you like, for the history books. Um, when it happened in January 1933, there wasn't actually those um, appreciative crowds there. Um, so that wouldn't do. And uh, in August of the next year, they reshot the occasion, as we said, for the history books. Uh, a perfect example of um, Nazi propaganda, but you've got to obviously know it when you look at that picture. Um, we're going to have a look now though in room three, which shows us um, again another event that was very expedient um, for uh, the Nazi party. And this was also in 1933. Um, Again, some of you may recognize the picture here. Um, it's what today we call the Bundestag, uh, the Reichstag. And it was a, there was a fire here. Although we don't know who actually set the fire, a culprit was apprehended and also paid uh, with the deed for his life, whether he committed it or not. Um, but as we said, for the Nazi party and for Hitler, it came um, at the right moment because it enabled uh, the Nazis to say, look uh, to everybody, uh, we're under threat here. We need to be protected. We need extraordinary measures. Um, we have to introduce emergency laws here. And that, of course, was very dangerous, as you can imagine. Um, it resulted in what we call in German the Ermächtigungsgesetz, uh, the Enabling Acts, which basically or virtually turned Germany into a police state. And of course, the Nazis um, did not uh, mince their words. And very soon, political opponents, trade union leaders, um, intellectuals who had a different opinion, um, suffered a fate that was to become the norm. Um, if we look at this picture here, we can see Musterlager Dachau. Uh, Musterlager is basically, um, you could say, the blueprint for the many concentration camps that were going to be set up at Dachau. And in fact, it was at Dachau, set up in 1933, March 1933, uh, that the SS were to get their training. Um, later on, of course, we had 70, 80 uh, camps and thousands of satellite camps. Um, we're going to look next at um, what came after. So you basically um, make sure the opposition is isolated, where they cannot make uh, any protests, any effective protests. So anybody um, brave enough to stand up is immediately isolated from the rest of the society. And then we take things another step. If we have a look over at the posters here, you come here to these panels and we can see what uh, soon ensued. Uh, many are familiar with the burning of the books, um, as you can see, this took place all over the country. And if you look closer, we can see some of the books that were burned. Uh, people like Erich Mario Remarque, 
all quite on the Western Front and the likes. Um, another uh, person whose books were burned uh, was a 19th century man of letters, a man called Heinrich Heine. And he prophetically was to have one of the characters in his place to say that wherever uh, books are burned, in the end, they will also burn people, human beings. Um, the burning of the books then, censorship, you're not allowed to read what you want, and you're not allowed to shop where you want either, especially, as you can see, if it was concerned with uh, shops owned by Jewish business people. Here you can see the poster, and interestingly, we're twisting the facts here because the poster says, uh, Germans, uh, defend yourselves, uh, don't buy from Jewish people. Uh, whereas, of course, who really needed to defend themselves uh, were obviously the Jewish people. Uh, but, of course, that was common to, to twist uh, the truth. So, uh, boycotting, persecution of Jewish people also, of course, begins at a very, very early stage. Uh, one of the first things that is forbidden is, of course, for Jewish people to be civil servants, for example. Uh, we're going to have a look at how society was organised under the Nazis in the next room. Um, it's probably the smallest room in the exhibition, and I sometimes think that that was intentional because it gives us an idea of how um, society was so strictly, um, soon very strictly, to be controlled. And if you look at the, the, the the posters, you can see, there's lots and lots of different signes. Uh, these represented all the different associations to which, basically, you really had to belong, probably also wanted to belong. But of course, for the Nazis, it was the perfect opportunity to keep people under surveillance um, and, of course, to indoct indoctrinate people as well. Um, if you take a closer look at what these associations were, you can see the, the lawyers, the, uh, the, the, the women's union, or You've got the Beamtenbund, that was the, the civil servants. So as you can see, you've got wide swathes of society where you're really under control through um, these different associations, as we said. And you can imagine how it would work. If you weren't a member, um, it would probably be very difficult to you know, get that next contract that was going to come your way. Um, who was going to get it? Well, probably the guy who's a party member. Uh, we've also got an interesting concept here too. Um, we've got um, Gemeinschaft statt Gesellschaft, as we say in German, but it means a community instead of society. So what we've really got here is this fixation on the Führer, the leader, and his people, the Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community, uh, which was taking the place of uh, democratic institutions. And really the Gleichschaltung, the bringing into line, the coordination, uh, was really a process that destroyed uh, the democratic fabric of the country very, very quickly. And of course, it was all very well for the people who were included in that society, but it was um, a very exclusive society, as we know, because so many people were indeed persecuted. And if we look at this picture here, uh, it really needs no explanation as to the people who were exempted uh, from that community, from political opponents to ordinary criminals, to immigrants, uh, to, interestingly, Bible researchers, these were Jehovah Witnesses, to homosexuals, and to people who were simply loosely termed um, asocial. Uh, so basically, anyone whom the Nazis uh, objected to, and their number, of course, was legion. Uh, from here, uh, we're going to uh, proceed to another room, and that concentrates really on the cult of the leader. We were talking about the leadership cult, the Führer cult, and that explains very nicely um, how that was achieved. The picture probably doesn't need much explanation, um, but you know where was it? Um, it's near Hanover. Uh, it was a place called the Bukaburg, um, and it was the harvest Thanksgiving uh, ceremony. It's perhaps interesting to note that um, the Nazis probably intended to dis, um, 
disband all religious ceremonies as we know them, like Christmas, Easter, etc. Eventually, uh, the year's calendar would have been taken over by purely Nazi events, uh, the 1st of May, for example, the Harvest Thanksgiving, and of course here, um, probably the most important of all, the, the Nazi party rallies in September. No. And as you can see, the emphasis was on these massed events. Again, we're back to the community and the Führer, and the picture shows you how that worked. The masses, of course, were just a mass. That was why they were important. But if you look at the masses there, they're all blurred. Uh, there was no room for individualism. Now, you were only important in the sense that you were part of that mass, all eyes, as is perfectly expressed by the picture, are centred on, of course, uh, the Führer. And uh, again, this, of course, underscores this cult of the leader. And in fact, uh, basically, um, Hitler more or less takes on divine proportions. And when you're looking at the events, at the rallies, you do get um, this um, extreme sense of religious overtones. And it's something that is also captured um, by a very talented filmmaker that we'll come across later on in the museum, whom you also might know, a woman called Leni Riefenstahl, who made a film in 1934 of the rallies. It was called Triumph of the Will. And in that film, she also captures that uh, pseudo-religious atmosphere that turns Hitler into uh, this almost uh, messianic figure, as he was, of course, keen to portray himself. Uh, um, how do you do that? Well, um, as we do in advertising, um, if we'll have a look at this little inset over here, uh, you can also see the various, um, what we would probably nowadays call uh, various forms of merchandising. Uh, one of them I find particularly interesting, if we look closely at it, we'll see this little sort of um, a traditional style um, of window, the little panes, the rounded panes, and they all have cameos, cameos of great figures from German history like Goethe or Beethoven, Bach, um, and of course um, you bask basically in reflected glory because who's at the centre of that all? Uh, the greatest of them all, of course, it's Hitler's cameo. Yeah. So quite a neat little touch there. Um, on the other hand, um, if you look on the other side, uh, it gives you an idea of the um, extent to which this merchandising uh, went. Um, over here you can see um, basically the mass production of all these Hitler uh, busts there. You simply had to have one in your home. And indeed, you were probably keen to as well. So the cult of the leader, uh, very much to the fore. What we haven't talked about, though, um, here in Nuremberg, was why did Hitler actually decide to have the rallies here? And that's really the subject of our next room, Room 6. So join me in Room 6. What we can see here um, is um, a Lufthansa plane. Um, it's actually a still uh, from the film I mentioned, uh, Triumph of the Will by Leni Riefenstahl. Um, and it's one of the opening shots. Um, the first shot, uh, again, is very interesting because all you see is a, a cloudy firmament um, with all the connotations, of course, of the Führer arriving uh, out of the skies, etc., etc. And Leni Riefenstahl is very um, Cleverly, she captures Nuremberg, but she captures the aspect of Nuremberg. Uh, the Nazis, of course, were uh, keen to emphasize, which was Nuremberg's um, historic significance. Um, that's the castle, of course. And here, of course, we're talking about uh, what many people uh, called the secret capital of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, the first great empire. Uh, many British or English, not British, but many English speakers um, often wondering, the Third Reich, the Third Empire, how did that come about? But what you're looking at here um, is Nuremberg as a symbol of the First Great Empire. The Second Empire um, was basically founded by Bismarck, um, um, Kaiser Wilhelm, and the Hohenzollern family had, of course, also once owned the castle here at Nuremberg, so we even had a tie in there with the Second Empire. It was a short step then for Hitler to say, the Third Reich, the Third Empire. So 
one of the reasons for choosing Nuremberg was certainly the historic significance and the emotional impact uh, that you know that would um, arouse, evoke in people's minds. Um, obviously, there were um, very practical reasons for holding it in Nuremberg as well, and one of them, of course, was centrality. If you look at a map of Europe today, uh, you'll find that uh, Franconia and Nuremberg is pretty bang centre. Um, you also had in the 19th, late 19th, early 20th century, a development in Nuremberg's economic history, which was the Industrial Revolution. And Nuremberg becomes an important industrial city with a very efficient infrastructure to match. Um, the Nazi party rallies attracted around a million people to them every year for one whole year, week in September. Just imagine trying to get that amount of people to a place if you don't have an efficient infrastructure. Nuremberg had it. So again, a very good reason for holding uh, the rallies here and the proximity to Munich, uh, the heart of the movement where the Nazi party was founded in 1919. So you had a lot of um, aspects that spoke in Nuremberg's favour. Um, here, of course, you can also see that uh, the propagandists were quick uh, to translate that into pictorial form. And you can see this very impressive um, poster here. But again, um, we're doing the same thing here as Leni Riefenstahl has done. You are concentrating everything onto the walled medieval city of Nuremberg, entirely ignoring the fact that there's a lot more. Uh, there's the modern Nuremberg that grew up in the early 20th century which, of course, does not interest the propagandists here. And again, you've got an inset here of Hitler proudly presenting uh, what we would probably call the crown jewels, part of the crown jewels, to uh, the reigning uh, mayor of Nuremberg at the time, a man called Willy Liebel. Uh, the crown jewels had actually been kept uh, for quite some time in Vienna, but with the Anschluss in 1938, Hitler decided it was time to bring them back to their true abode. Uh, for many centuries, they had been kept in Nuremberg. So, of course, again, this was a, um, an act loaded with symbolism. Um, from this poster here, which is obviously from the style of topography, is uh, geared to attract a more conservative audience. Um, if we look over on the other uh, wall, uh, you can see a different style of poster here. Um, which obviously dynamic, the way the uh, typography is designed, it's obviously um, aiming at a younger group of people, um, sort of the connotation is here, you know, come to the Nazi party rallies, you're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, so you're trying, of course, to uh, attract as broad um, a, a range of target audiences as possible. We're going to continue now and take a closer look in detail at what you know, actually went on at these rallies. Um, and here we have um, Albert Speer, who was um, generally responsible uh, for all buildings um, on the Nazi party rally grounds, the Reichsbaumeister, um, as he was called. He was later, or he was going to be entrusted, um, even with remodeling uh, Berlin, which was going to become the world metropolis Germania. Those plans, of course, were never realized. Similarly, as we said, to a lot of the plans um, here too on the Nazi party rally grounds, never realized. And if we look across on the other wall here, uh, we can see one, of course, with which we are familiar. Um, we're in it at the moment, uh, the Congress Hall, which was actually uh, not designed by Albert Speer, but by local architects, um, um, father and son, uh, the roofs. But then you have other models of uh, projects that were designed by Albert Speer, but of course never realized. The March Field Parade Ground, which was never realized. And of course here as well, we have this massive stadium, the German Stadium. It was going to have a capacity of almost half a million people. Uh, today, what became of it? Um, if you go out onto the Nazi Party rally grounds, you'll find a rather pretty lake. It's called the, the Silver Lake, the Silver Sea. That's all that remains of what was really an excavation pit for the German stadium. Begun at a later stage in 1938, it really never got off the ground. 
But what we do see here is the monumental architecture, of course, that was designed to glorify the regime. Obviously, the Nazis are not the first people to think of doing that. If you look through history, uh, many uh, civilizations have um, used buildings uh, to, as a vehicle for their propaganda. Hitler, of course, very clearly uh, said it. Um, architecture is ideology set in stone. And Albert Speer, of course, was the man to translate that into stone form. Um, we have all these amazing buildings, but of course, um, we also, appearances are deceptive, aren't they? And we have what uh, these buildings were basically built on. And if you'll join me through here, uh, we're going to have a look at um, the grim reality uh, behind the buildings. Albert Speer actively uh, funded and supported the SS, who in 1938 um, started forming co commercial companies, earthwork and quarrying companies. And you can probably guess, if you look at the picture, what they did. They set up work camps, concentration camps, next to these quarries. And the inmates, of course, worked in appalling conditions and were basically worked to death. Uh, the picture here shows you um, the, the quarry at Flossenburg, Flossenburg concentration camp in the Palatinate, the Rhineland Palatinate, about two hours away from here. And um, stone uh, mined here, quarried here, and Flossenburg was used on the rally grounds. Um, Flossenburg had around 100,000 inmates, of whom around a third perished and lost their lives. Average life expectancy at Flossenburg, once you got there, was around eight months. We're going to continue now, though, and uh, we're going to have a look at, uh, as we said, what actually went on at these rallies. Each day, as we said, they lasted a week. Um, well, originally they lasted um, around five days. The first one was five days, but they became so popular that by 1938, when the last rally was held, they'd been extended to eight days. Uh, such was their popularity. Um, this event that we're going to look at here with the, the young girls in their white dresses only took place once. It was called the Day of Community. Um, the organizers decided maybe a little light relief. But it's also a good example of how important or the role played by women um, in the, the Nazi regime, which was a very traditional one. Uh, women were really there to, you know, mind the kids, uh, stay in the kitchen and do the church going. Kinder, Küche, Kirche, as the Germans say, and of course, produce babies. Um, that was one way of getting a medal. Um, apparently, if you produced four children, you would get a bronze medal. Um, if you produced eight, you got a silver, and anything over 10 was a gold. Uh, but otherwise, um, no uh, women really figured in the higher echelons of the Nazi party. So from women, we can have a look at the children, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Hitler Youth Organization. And again, here we see a picture of these young uh, youngsters here, proudly marching, bearing arms, or not bearing arms, but bearing their flags, but in many cases, soon to bear arms as well. Um, the Hitler Youth was divided up into two groups. Um, the 10s to 14s, the 14s to 18s, and of course the 14s to 18s would be already getting um, sort of more or less military training um, and would take their oath and join the army, uh, as we can imagine. But this gives us an idea of the pride that was experienced by these young men coming or having the honour to come down and parade at Nuremberg. In fact, uh, we know that um, some of them who lived up in the north of Germany, they uh, were let out of school early and uh, walked six weeks to get to Nuremberg. Um, another picture is interesting because we've already uh, talked about the religious um, atmosphere that was evoked at uh, these events. And this one is, is a class in, in, or a case in point. Um, it was the so-called cult of the dead. And as you can see from those faces there, it's a very solemn occasion. Um, it's um, at a site just across from this building here in a park. And uh, this um, grandstand was specially built for it. 
And basically we are celebrating here, or commemorating, uh, the cult of the dead martyrs who'd lost their lives in the failed uh, Putsch, Beer Hall Putsch of 1923. And Hitler actually you know, had a so-called blood flag on which the, the blood of these martyrs had been spilt. And he would uh, ceremoniously touch it to all the standards of the modern day um, units, um, thus imbuing more or less the spirit of these martyrs uh, onto future generations. So again, uh, the religious connotations there are unmistakable. The cult of the dead and the blood flag. Or here, as you can see, as we said, each day is devoted to a different organization. So here it's the day of the SS and the SA. Uh, they were the participants in that event, um, around 250,000 of them in all. Uh, so a massed event as we are um, familiar with at the rallies. Um, over here, um, I, there's an aspect that we haven't had a look at yet, um, beyond, of course, um, drumming up support um, and celebrating the, the cult of the Führer. Um, an aspect that is often ignored is the fact that it was a very money-making event as well, because these events weren't free. Huh? You had to pay admission fees, and if we look over here, you can see the... Um, the admission tickets. Um, back then, um, they cost between three and five rice marks uh, from around 30 to 50 euros, uh, the equivalent today. And if you think about uh, some of the events attracting crowds of up to 140,000, well, yeah, that's quite a lot of money. So it was a very money-making event. Uh, you could call it the classical win-win situation for the Nazis. They get to indoctrinate people and they get them to pay for their own indoctrination. Um, this uh, poster here is a notice. It says, Der Reichspartei abgesagt, uh, which means cancelled. And this was actually in 1939. Um, Prior to 1939, the 1939 rally never actually took place. Um, you can probably guess why. On the 1st of September 1939, uh, Germany invaded Poland and that triggered the Second World War. Um, all the rallies, by the way, um, had mottos. Um, uh, from the, the Rally of Freedom to the Rally of Victory. And of course, um, the motto, although it was never held, the motto had already been uh, chosen uh, for the 1939 rally. It was going to be called the Rally of Peace. Um, in hindsight, these mottos were all rather cynical, but that really was the most cynical of them all, the Rally of Peace. Uh, we're going to head now um, uh, up the stairs here to another part of the exhibition. So we'll head all way now from the, um, the Nazi party rallies themselves to take a little look um, or a closer look at ordinary life um, and its aspects um, under the Nazis. And um, if we look over here, uh, we can already see on this poster, again, we have the name Nuremberg, uh, the Nuremberg Laws. They were promulgated uh, during the 1935 rally. Um, as we said, all the rallies had mottos. The 1935 rally motto was the Rally of Freedom. And as we said, they often had cynical connotations. Um, and that indeed, uh, in a sense, was cynical because the Nuremberg uh, Laws severely restricted the freedoms of the Jewish people at that time. Um, and again, of course, you have um, uh, the, the contents of the Nuremberg Laws, which among other things uh, stipulated, of course, that there should be no um, intermarriage uh, with Aryans and uh, Jewish people, um, people who defied um, these rules, um, as we can see on this panel here, uh, were of course publicly humiliated as this young girl uh, has been um, herded through the streets there and having to uh, bear this poster in front of her because she apparently had a romantic attachment to a Jewish person. Uh, so you're, you're publicly disgraced, so to speak. Um, the Nuremberg laws then, the Nuremberg race laws, and um, life becomes increasingly uh, difficult uh, for Jewish people. 
Um, over here, uh, we also have an extract um, of the film that we've mentioned quite a lot, um, the, the Triumph of the Will by Leni Riefenstahl. Uh, that film, of course, um, was very uh, useful uh, for the Nazis. We said about a million people uh, visited the rallies. The population of Germany at the time, though, was 60 million. And uh, the Nazis, of course, figured, what's a good way of you know, bringing these events to a wider audience? And of course, they hit upon the idea of making a film. And the film was shown in all the cinemas, the length and breadth of the country. In schools, it was compulsory viewing. At the time, it's, um, it was recognized for what it was, which was, of course, an excellent piece of work. And it won prizes at the Cannes Film Festival and at the World Exhibition in Paris. Uh, but of course it was a perfect piece of propaganda. Um, if you get the chance, you should have a look at it. Um, here we see again um, part of the filming of the Cult of the Dead and the Blood Flag that we've just had a look at. But as we said, we want to take a closer look at ordinary life and again uh, the fact that indoctrination was taken right down uh, to the very smallest and the very youngest members of society. So if you follow me here, we'll have a look at the display cases uh, just in the next part of the exhibition. So here we can see that um, the indoctrination um, took place at a very early age. Um, um, if we look at some of the examples in the, in the showcase, uh, we've got perhaps first graders here uh, simply practicing their letters. Um, I think when I was at school we wrote the cat sat on the mat, but um, uh, German school children of the day had um, quite different sentences um, to practice their letters. Um, here we can see die Juden ist unsere Unglück um, and we can see that the posters were widespread. Um, they would be easily um, memorable and copied. Um, Jews are our misfortune, basically. And then we have the accompanying uh, pictures, uh, stereotypes of uh, the Jew portrayed really as the archetypal bogeyman. So you can imagine the effect that that would have on young untutored minds and even the, the fairy tales, the poets, uh, the poetry, etc. Um, uh, similarly illustrated here, uh, casting the Jew in the role of the uh, the baddie, so to speak, or worse. Um, not just um, literature, even games um, were in a similar tone. And here you have roughly the equivalent of what we would call Ludo, just a board game where you have to, you know, get rid of the, the opponents, um, knock them off the field. And of course, um, here you have uh, Jewish people being knocked off the field. Um, uh, very um, interestingly sent to collection points and hence to Palestine. Uh, that was the, the purpose of the game. And again, you have a typical conical hat uh, that was the typical headgear of Jewish people, at least in medieval times. Um, so again, even games uh, have these undertones. Um, this at grassroots level, and if we take a look at uh, some of the other um, posters or panels here, uh, we can see, of course, that um, other restrictions uh, were imposed um, on society. Uh, we've also, uh, we've already talked about persecution uh, of Jewish people, that's what most readily springs to mind. But of course, Sinti and Roma uh, were also persecuted, and it wasn't just persecution. Um, um, it also extended to German people themselves. Um, the term euthanasia uh, springs out here, uh, because of course the Nazi dictum was, if you weren't of sound mind and body, uh, of course, you were not fit to be a member of that Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community. And the euthanasia program uh, carried out by the Nazis claimed around 335,000 lives. Uh, um, and again, as we said, here at the, the final um, panel here, uh, we're talking about alienization, uh, which was basically disabusing uh, Jewish people of their fortunes, of their possessions. People were forced to sell up um, at ridiculous prices, making it increasingly difficult, of course, for Jewish people to, to emigrate because they didn't have any uh, financial means to do so. Uh, 
Um, again, we're going to continue on our way now. So leaving um, behind the aspects of uh, life in Nuremberg, um, again, we see here on our left the run-up uh, to the Second World War, 1939. Uh, no more rallies are held here and uh, the devastation of the war uh, takes hold. 1939-1940, the Blitzkrieg, as it was called, uh, the invasion of Europe, which initially um, goes according to plan uh, for the Nazis. They become confident, 1940-1941, the armistice, and then things take a different turn with Operation Barbarossa, um, and of course, the many, many lives um, that the whole of the war cost. Here, of course, um, we have the role of the Einsatzgruppen, uh, the SS task forces, whose job was to go behind the Wehrmacht, uh, the German army, as it proceeded into the, uh, the Eastern territories. And um, the course, of course, of um, annihilating people of, of Jewish origin. We see the pictures here, the devastating pictures. Uh, which, of course, ultimately resulted in the last panel here, um, Holocaust, um, a term with which we are all familiar, um, the utter uh, terror of the death camps. And, of course, it also takes us um, through to this um, last part of the exhibition as well. The picture that we see in front of us here um, is one that would be very common um, throughout uh, Germany. The picture that meets, us eye, that meets our eye here um, is of Nuremberg, uh, post 2nd of January 1945. Once known as the Schetz cast line, basically uh, the gem of, of, of Germany, one of the most beautifully preserved medieval cities, was laid um, in ruin by the British RAF on the 2nd of January 1945. And that was also the scene um, that backdropped uh, the liberation of Nuremberg, um, officially held on the 20th of April 1945 by the Americans, although fighting was still going on, the last pocket of resistance centered around the police headquarters. Um, all was over, and a few months later, just a few months later, another major event took place in Nuremberg, and it's probably um, the event with which uh, the name of Nuremberg is mostly associated, certainly for Anglo-Saxons, um, and that, of course, is the Nuremberg Trials. Um, if you join me over at these panels here, uh, we can take a look at the scene of that historic event. Um, um, here in Nuremberg, again, why Nuremberg? Many people ask that question. But again, like the rallies, it was basically for purely practical uh, reasons that the Nuremberg trials were held here. Um, if we look at this picture here, um, you can see um, the Palace of Justice, uh, the courthouses, and you can see that uh, despite all the devastation we've just witnessed, here the building was intact. And that was really largely the reason for choosing Nuremberg. Obviously, there was a symbolism as well, but a practical reason. The courtroom was extended because, of course, it was attended by a great many people. Um, a lot of the visitors were international journalists. Around 350 international journalists covered the trials. Um, here we have um, the panel of judges, and you can see by the four national flags there who was involved. Uh, which, in some case, of course, led to being called victor's justice. Was it so? You had the four allied powers, Russia, America, France, and Great Britain. Each of those countries uh, presented two judges, and the prosecution teams were also provided by those countries. Who was on trial there? Um, there were many trials. There were 12 trials and one major trial, the very first trial of the main Nazi war criminals, the leading Nazis who were still there and could be held accountable for their deeds. Men like, uh, with his back slightly turned towards us, Hermann Göring, Rudolf Hess, of course, his unmistakable looks. And of course, the man we've mentioned so often, Albert Speer, um, here 
in the second row. Um, Albert Speer did not remain the architect, the Reichsbaumeister, but in 1943 became a very efficient Minister of Armaments and was, of course, largely responsible. Um, people believed in him and they believed in that tale of the Wunderwaffe, the wonder weapon, perhaps becoming true and saving the day um, at the last minute. It obviously didn't happen. Um, at the end of the day, the sentences um, provided quite a bit of surprise. A lot of people had been actually expecting a blanket death sentence for all concerned. That wasn't the case. There were 12 death sentences, seven periods of imprisonment, and even three acquittals. Uh, so the Nuremberg trials, um, another chapter that one could spend quite a lot of time talking about, but we want to head out and take a last look at the Congress Hall. So join me outdoors now. Before we finish uh, the, our virtual tour, I'd like to draw your attention to this um, temporary exhibition. Um, it was called The Dusk Lice, The Track. Um, a temporary ex exhibition, it was talking about the role of the rice ban in the deportation of so many Jewish people to the death camps. And if we look across there, we can see many of the names uh, which are engraved on so many people's memories. Um, once called by uh, a professor of Holocaust studies, um, the perfect uh, murder, because many of the people who died at Treblinka, Belzec, Chelmo, there are absolutely no traces of those people left today. Um, the, the track then. Um, if you look closely, you can see uh, cards with the names of around 6,000 uh, victims um, of the Holocaust. They stand symbolically for the six million who lost their lives. So, as we uh, promised, uh, we're heading out of the um, exhibition, but not out of the building. And uh, if we take a look in front of us, we can see uh, the other tip of the spear that we talked about earlier, the spear through the spear, and it leads uh, right out um, into the center of the building as a viewing platform. And what are we viewing? Um, what Hitler referred to as his cathedral, the cathedral of the movement, which of course, if we look at it now, is hard to believe. It was, as we said, never finished. But if we look at this picture here, um, a model from 1936, um, we can prepare, of course, uh, the reality with what was proposed. Um, instead of just the bare bones of a building, it would have all been clad in, in marble, uh, you wouldn't have seen any of the bare brickwork, of course. And unlike today, uh, with the building open to the sky, it was going to be covered by a glass roof with a capacity for around, um, uh, around 50,000 people. Uh, this building was actually only going to be used once a year. They even um, intended to, to mount the world's largest organ in this building. So not only would you have had the full visual impact, uh, it would also have been audio-visual to attack basically all the senses. Well, that um, brings uh, me uh, to the end of our virtual tour of the museum. I hope you found it informative. I hope you've learned perhaps things you didn't know. Uh, that's it from me. Uh, goodbye.